Well, good afternoon and welcome to Wednesday in the Word. We're glad that you've joined with us today. And uh, if you will, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Numbers. The book of Numbers, chapter 12. The book of Numbers, chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12 is a uh, really a part two of uh, Numbers chapter 11. Uh, these are tandem chapters as far as what their theme is and what they are dealing with, but uh, in two different directions. And uh, I thought about combining them, but I, as I began to study it, I thought it best to just look at them as separately. When I was, and I've shared this before, when I worked on my uh, doctoral degree, my PhD in seminary, uh, my field that I studied was in the area of church conflict. And what I did is I studied churches in the uh, association in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, about church conflict and relationship to growth, about uh, how it affects a church, how churches uh, can come through conflict well and get on the other side and continue to grow and conflict that is very difficult and learned a lot when it comes to that. I, I interviewed, um, I made a case study of six different churches and studied the, the history, the pastors, uh, did numerous interviews with all kinds of people and then came up with the conclusions that were in that dissertation. Um, one of the things that I have that are a constant uh, in, in church life and probably have been in yours uh, is at some point in your life, in your church life, uh, that you will uh, unfortunately experience uh, being in a church that's with difficulty, where there is a conflict. Um, it can be between people in the church. It can be most likely, generally, most church conflicts center somewhere within the church leadership, uh, whether in the staff or with the pastor or deacons uh, or whatever. Generally, it, that's where it's concentrated, and then from there, um, sides get drawn up, uh, things can happen, and things can get out of hand. And uh, churches gr create great, great damage uh, to themselves and to the kingdom of God. There are churches that don't survive conflict. Uh, there are churches that have patterns of it. They just simply go and they do. This is what they do. Uh, a pastor will go there, uh, stay about. The, the average tenure of a pastor in the SBC is about three years. There's a reason for that. Because in about three years is when most pastors experience conflict in the church. Those that weather the storm and continue on uh, can generally continue to, uh, to serve there and to can have a fruitful ministry. Um, unfortunately, many after about three years decide I've had enough, they go to some other place. Uh, they think it's a better place and they go there in about three years and they go to another. Uh, that is not, unfortunately, an uncommon pattern. In Numbers chapter 11, the, the uh, criticism and complaining is with the children of Israel, and it's about their circumstances. Uh, they're in the wilderness. Uh, they have been at the mountain and received. They've been there for about 10 to 11 months. They're at Mount Sinai. They've been asked by God to move on. It's time to go on to the promised land. And as a result of that, they're about three days into their journey when they just come to Moses and they start complaining. And they say, you know, we, it was better in Egypt and all these kind of things. And we dealt with that last time. In Numbers chapter 12, the, the, the difficulty is more personalized. In Numbers 11, it was, it, people were complaining, they were complaining to Moses, but they were complaining about their circumstances. And so Moses then in turn comes to God with the complaints. In Numbers chapter 12, the complaint is lodged against Moses. And it comes from not the people at large, but it comes from his brother and sister. This comes from Aaron and Moses, I mean Miriam. Uh, if you remember Miriam, Miriam is his older sister. Aaron is the older brother. Moses is the baby of the three. Miriam was the one who helped save Moses' life. You know, she, God used her to pick up the, you know, uh, the, direct the uh, Egyptian, Egyptian princess to the baby there and help save his life and got her mother to come in to be the wet nurse for, uh, for Moses. So Miriam had a great part in the, even the life of Moses. And uh, she has been a part of the, uh, along with Aaron and her, the three of them have kind of been a, a leadership team. Moses has always been the preeminent one, but uh, Miriam has been a significant person 
And so in Numbers chapter 12, they, following out with the criticism of the entire group, these bring a complaint about Moses. So let's pick it up at Numbers chapter 12. The Bible says Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. And they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very meek, more than all the people who were on the face of the earth. Here's the key truth I want us to look at, and then we're going to look at these first three verses that give us the root of this criticism. While there are times when it is appropriate to confront a spiritual leader for wrong behavior, it should always be done in the right way, the correct way, biblical way, and there is, and prayerfully we'll get to that as we continue on. Well, what is the root of the criticism here? Now, notice it's personally directed from Aaron and Miriam to Moses. Well, the Bible tells us, says, first of all, says, they spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married. Now, there are some who believe that Zipporah was his wife and that either he married a second time or she had died and he married again. Well, the only difficulty with that is that it never says anywhere where Zip Zipporah died and it does not say that this was a second marriage. So what we believe is that this Cushite woman, now it says Cushite. I think that King James puts the word Ethiopian. Uh, and we know when that she was from an area called Midian. Well, historians believe that Cush, Cush and Midian were just a name for the same place, same name for the same place. So bottom line is that this Cushite woman is Zipporah. In other words, they've known her for a long time. Here's the, so their, their problem is they're complaining against Moses because of his wife. They don't like his wife. Now, why don't they like his wife? Well, she's not Jewish. She's not from there. She is uh, from another tribe. She's from another uh, cultural group. You know, and I think you begin, I think you can see if they're bringing in their complaint against his wife, who would have of anyone who would have great influence in the life of Moses? His wife. If you remember, it was Zipporah that saved the life of Moses' son. Remember that? When the Lord came against him because Moses had not circumcised and she did it. She, in some instances, has more spiritual insight than Moses. And remember, it is her father, Jethro, who has been a great help. So Jethro has, been, has had a lot of influences in Moses' life. His wife has influence in his life. She's a believer. They don't like her. I, and, but then I want you to know this goes on. It says, now they give a, there's, in every kind of criticism of a spiritual leader, there is the stated reason, and then there's the real reason. The real reason is they don't like his wife. Now what's the stated reason? What did they say out loud? And it says, and they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? Now, what's the secondary reason? And this is the, this is how they, they spiritualize it. Well, is Moses the only, I mean, can you, can you not hear the tone of their voice? Is Moses the only one? Is he, is he the only one that God has spoken to? Well, there's, there's Aaron and there's Miriam. There's the two of us. God has spoken to us too. We're just as important as Moses. And who is Moses? Who, do, who is Moses? Let me tell you how this gets couched toward a pastor. Oh, he's a dictator. He does everything. He just makes decisions and does things and doesn't consult anybody and doesn't ask anybody. And he didn't ask our opinion and he did that and just, well... Who does he think he is? Does he think he's the only one who speaks for God? Now, can spiritual leaders be arrogant and proud? Yes. All spiritual leaders are human and can be subject to sinful passions. Here's the problem. Moses is not. So, you see, the, the stated thing is, is that 
well, we're just as spiritually in tune as Moses is. Where does that, where does that outward criticism come? It comes from their envious. They, they're envying Moses' position. They, maybe they are, have some envy against Zipporah. They don't like her. Maybe don't like his influence on Moses. So this is a personal sin issue. And they come against Moses. So this is the root of the criticism. I like what Ian Duguid said. He says, notice that Miriam and Aaron didn't talk to Moses about the problem. Nor did they talk to God about the problem. Instead, they simply grumbled about it, complaining to anyone who would listen about Moses' unfitness to be the sole leader of the people. In that way, they began to feel superior to Moses. This is a classic pattern. For us as much as for them, when there is an issue between us and someone else, it is much easier simply to grumble about the other person instead of going to him or her and seeking to resolve the issue. Now let me also bring some other context into their criticism against him, which can tell, tells me that their difficulty with Moses has been long-standing. They feel slighted. Remember, Moses is, Aaron is the oldest. In Jewish culture, it is the oldest who gets all the rights and whatever. But who's been bypassed? Aaron. Now he has significance, but he's, Moses is the clear leader of the family. Now, this thing about has God only spoken through? What, just, what did we just read about in chapter 11? What happened there? Remember when God's Spirit came upon 70 leaders? And now there are 70 different men who have been filled with the Spirit who are now filled. And they, talk, and they had the Spirit of Moses upon them. And, they're now, and remember earlier with Jethro, where Moses took his advice and he has divided up all of the responsibilities for judging among, among men that have been selected to be judges. So there is a pattern there with Moses giving leadership to other people, accepting the advice of Jethro in chapter 11. And he's going, man, I want God's spirit to bone everybody. There's nothing in Moses that says that he is power hungry, that he is wanting to be on top, that he is wanting to dominate and dictate and whatever. This is all invented in the heart and mind of an envious brother and sister. So that's the root of the criticism. Let's look at the response of God to the criticism. Notice what it says in last of, says in verse 2, and the Lord heard it. Let's go to verse 5, 4 through 9. And suddenly the Lord said to Moses and to Aaron and Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tent of meeting. And the three of them came out. And the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forward. And he said, Hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. In other words, there are people that I speak to, God says, that are my prophets. I speak to them. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. When I speak with him, I speak mouth to mouth clearly and not in riddles, and he beholds the form of the Lord. Remember how that Daniel the prophet received visions and dreams from the Lord. God spoke to him. Most of the prophets received their messages from the Lord in dreams and visions. Not so with Moses. God spoke to him face to face. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. Now look at verse 3, 2, and I want you to see this in context. It says, Now the man Moses was very meek, more than all people who were on the face of the earth. So what is the evaluation of the man that they are criticizing? The Bible says... There's not a power-hungry bone in his body. He is meek. He is humble. He is, that word means strength under control. And God says, he is my man. He's my chosen man. I speak to him. And he in turn speaks to you. And I have other prophets, but Moses is. Now remember, in our context, that we're talking about Moses is a Old Testament picture of the Lord Jesus. His Lordship. So, 
And I want us to, I need to stop and just say this right here. Um, a lot of times there are the, uh, the application that is made here is made wrongly. Here's the application that's made wrongly. Well, uh, and I've heard preachers preach on this before, and they say, well, this clearly says you should never confront uh, a pastor who was doing wrong, whatever, that you know, he's the God's anointed and don't, don't say anything. Well, I'm going to get to that because there is a procedure in place to be able to come to a pastor who's doing something wrong. But there's a proper way to do it. This is just an illustration of how it's not to be done. This is personal. It's petty. It comes from their own sinful nature. There is no evidence and the Bible is very clear. In other words, who comes to the thing about it, who comes to Moses' defense? Moses doesn't defend himself. God defends him. And God comes to Miriam and Moses, Miriam and Aaron, and says, "Hey, listen. Let me tell you who this man is. And you're barking up the wrong tree when you bar you're barking against this guy, because he's mine." So what does God do? He immediately calls out Aaron and, and, and Miriam. But God doesn't let it go. I mean, immediately, the next thing, he hears the criticism, he brings it out. He reaffirms his special relationship with Moses. Says that he's my faithful servant. And then I want you to notice that God's anger is kindled against Aaron and Moses. Matthew Henry in his commentary says this. Moses had often shown himself jealous for God's honor. Remember with all the times that we've studied about how that Moses has defended the honor of God and he's stood in the gap before the people and says, you know, kill me instead, you know, you know, uh, kill me instead of killing them. And I mean, he has stood up for the honor of the Lord. He's like, if, well, God, if you kill all these people, your honor will be defamed. Moses had often shown himself jealous for God's honor. And now God showed himself jealous for Moses' reputation. For those that honor God, God will honor. Isn't that great? Listen, when, you, when you, you honor the name of the Lord in your life and people come against you unfairly, God will protect your honor himself. He'll do it. He'll be your defender. Well, what are the results of the criticism? Look at verse 10. And when the cloud removed from over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous like snow. And Aaron turned toward Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said to Moses, O oh my Lord, do not punish us because we have done foolishly and have sinned. Let her not be as one dead whose flesh is half eaten away when he comes out of the mother's womb. Moses cried to the Lord, O oh God, please heal her, please. But the Lord said to Moses, if her father had but spit in her face, should she not be shamed seven days? Let her be shut outside the camp seven days. And after that, she may be brought in again. So Moses was shut outside the camp seven days, and the people did not set out on the march till Miriam was brought in again. After that, the people set out from Hezeroth and camped in the wilderness of Paran. Well, what are the results of the criticism? Well, first of all, it was hurtful to Moses. Who can hurt you the most? People that you love the most. Who's the closest to Moses? His sister. I mean, he loves his older sister. I have two older sisters. And uh, my family, there's five of my family, and there's kind of a big gap of age between the oldest and the youngest, 20 years to be exact. And my oldest sister, name is Barbara, is... Um, I was the ring bearer in her wedding, so that tells you our age difference. And in many ways, uh, she has been like a mother to me. In fact, she still is. Uh, she still thinks I'm 12 years old. But anyway, <laughs> I, I, I love her. She loves me. We have a great relationship and a great sister. But, I, you know, I, I, I know that endearment of older sisters. Um, and, you know, you come from the same family, and she has that history of saving him, and he knows that. And Aaron, his brother, I mean, you know, when Moses couldn't, when he came to God and says, God, I can't speak, and okay, I'll use your brother Aaron. And so God uses Aaron to be the spokesman for Moses. And, you know, Aaron becomes the high priest. I mean, he becomes the one who goes into the tabernacle and represents the people before God giving the blood sacrifice. I mean, Moses doesn't even do that. I mean, so a great spiritual heritage relationship. He's worked with these people, you know, 
loves them, and they're the very ones who come against him. Hurtful. Hurtful. It was offensive to God. God heard it, and immediately, the Bible says, he kindled his anger. That means he stoked his anger. God got, God got mad and then got madder. And says, I'm not going to, when God gets mad and he kindles his anger, he's going to do something about it. Anger is to move us to doing the right thing. Now, oftentimes anger can be sinful, but anger is a good emotion. Because anger, God was righteously indignant for Moses. And so he came after Miriam and Aaron. It was damaging to the criticizers. What happens to Miriam? She gets leprosy. What's well, leprosy? It's a fatal disease. Skin disease, painful. She would have been, if she remained with leprosy, she would have been an outcast the rest of her life. She would not allow to be with her family. She would not allow to come into the worship in the tabernacle. She would have been an outcast the rest of her life if she didn't have leprosy. Now, question comes here. The Bible says Aaron and Miriam both complained against Moses. Why does Miriam get leprosy and Aaron gets left out? Don't know exactly how the Bible tells us this. Speculation would be is that is that Miriam was the ringleader. And I want and I the, in doing reading and studying and looking at this, and I think the indication is there is that, and it says that Miriam and Aaron starts with her. The Bible, when it puts words in order, even in the Bible, has a significance to it. And she's listed first. So here's probably what happened. Miriam started the complaining. She started, and then she went to Aaron and go, well, who's that, that woman that he's married in? She's not a one of us, and, you know, we're just as special as Moses is. And Aaron was like, yeah, 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 you're right on that. Here's the, here's the difference. It started in the heart. She was the misleader. She was the one who started it. Aaron went along with it. Now, is he guilty? Yes, he went along with it. But he didn't instigate it. That happens a lot in conflict. You have someone who's behind it. Someone who started it. Someone who's got a beef against the pastor or someone else or a staff member or something. And then they go to other people and then they do the recruitment process. You know what recruiting is? Well, they did this and did this and did this. And Now, for most people and people who, they go, man, you know, yeah. Get away from me. That is not true. I don't believe that. You know, that is gossip. Get out of here. Go on. Now, that's the proper response. What was Aaron's response? Yeah. 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 I, yeah, I, yeah, I can see that now. He didn't start it. But he didn't stop it. When there's a conflict in the church. You may not be the person who starts it. But if it comes to you through the rumor mill and the gossip mill and you don't stop it, you're just as guilty. Now, there are differences of consequences. I understand that. And Miriam gets the leprosy. Aaron immediately goes into, oh, oh. I think his love for his sister was his punishment. And he was realizing what happened. And I think that's the punishment that Aaron gets. And immediately goes to Moses and so go, isn't it interesting that the man they have just criticized for being the one who only speaks for God is the one they go to and say, speak to us for God. <laughs> you know, come on now, intercede for us. The very thing they criticize him for is the very thing that right now they need. They need somebody who can come into God's presence. They need somebody who can speak to God. They need somebody who can pray and God can hear you, you notice the pleading there in Moses, and he says, Oh God, please heal her. Please. God would have been absolutely just for Miriam to remain a leper the rest of her life. He does answer the prayer of his servant Moses that I will heal her. But Moses, first of all, she's going to have this for seven days. So unceremoniously, they take Miriam, his sister, and they proceed to walk her out Inside the camp. She would no longer could stay inside the camp. And they set her up a little tent out in the periphery, and the entire nation of Israel for seven days camps there. 
For seven days, she's in that tent seeing her skin. For seven days, she's understanding what she has done. And then after seven days, she wakes up in the morning and the white leprosy is gone. She's completely healed. And now as a result of that, she leaves the tent, comes back into the camp, comes to, I think the first thing she does, I don't know this, the Bible doesn't say it, but I think the first thing she does is that she hugs the neck of her brother Moses and say, Moses, thank you. I am so sorry. What was another consequence of what, Moses, what Aaron and Miriam did? The nation of Israel for seven days came to a stop. Where was the nation of Israel supposed to be hidden? Three days ago, they, several days ago, they had started on their journey, started complaining, then they had difficulty. They're now back on their journey. Now they're stopped in their tracks. In other words, the nation of Israel is no longer able to go forward because of this sin. And I think there's an application there. A church cannot go forward in its mission to share the gospel of Christ and everything when there is conflict comes to a grinding halt until it's dealt with. Then after seven days, there's repentance, Miriam is changed, and God begins to move forward. John Butler said this. And I'm going to read to, um, he said, we need to remember these truths when God's faithful servants are being maligned by the critics. Do not chime in with the critics. Rather, turn away from the critics, for their criticism only hurts God's work. Churches have made great mistakes in listening to the dissonance criticize God's man in the church. Evil needs to be put out of the church, not honored. Listening to the dissonance criticize a pastor is to give honor to evil. A multitude of churches have not grown, and some have been dissolved because the criticism of God's man has been given much who has been given much respect while the criticized pastor has been treated disrespectfully. In some churches, the criticized pastor is more likely to be voted out than the dissidents. That surely shows the poor spiritual condition of those churches. What are the lessons learned? Here are several of these. We'll come to a conclusion. Moses. Moses learned that humility is the best response to criticism. He learned that humility is the best response. Moses didn't get mad at his brother and sister. He didn't strike out at Adam. Moses knew that he was innocent. He knew that, I like someone says this, don't ever try to defend yourself. Your enemies won't believe it and your friends don't need it. I like that. He didn't defend himself. Who did he allow God to do? Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. I'm telling you, when you're unfairly criticized and somebody comes against you, your best defense is God. God will take care of it in a way that you never can. God will take care of it. What did Aaron and Miriam learn? First of all, they learned the value of intercession when Moses pleaded for them for Miriam to be healed. And they learned the sweetness of grace and forgiveness. Thankfully, there was a repentant spirit in Aaron and Miriam, and they repented. God forgave them. God healed Miriam. I don't think they ever learned this lesson. I don't think they ever had this problem again till the day they died and Moses died. I don't think they ever went back to it. What did the people of Israel learn? Well, there's a verse of Scripture that's found in Deuteronomy chapter 24. Moses writes this just before the end of his life. The book of Deuteronomy is before the people of Israel go into the promised land, he gives them a whole book of, I want you to remember this, remember this, remember this, remember this, remember this. In Deuteronomy chapter 24, 9, one of the things that he tells the children of Israel, he says, Remember what the Lord your God did to Miriam, by the way, after you came out of Egypt. Don't forget what God did. In other words, Aaron, Moses is about to die, and Joshua is going to be the new leader. And what Moses is saying is that don't treat Joshua like my brother and sister treated me that time. Don't do that, because you remember what happened to her. It didn't work out well. Well, what's a lesson for that's the lesson for the people of Israel. They learned the importance of submitting to God's appointed leaders. What can we learn today? Now, I'll close with this, and I'm, I'm going to go into great detail, but I, the New Testament has a passage scripture that's found in 2 Timothy chapter 5. And you say, well, pastor, 
does that mean that you know if 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 a, if a pastor is doing or a spiritual leader is doing something wrong there there's you can't ever criticize you can't ever correct it you can't ever do no because God's men do get out of line but how do you deal with it well let me give you some requirements first of all 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 19 says do not admit a charge against an elder, that's a spiritual leader, except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, so that the rest may stand in fear. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. Well, first of all, it requires prayer, and first going personally and privately to the spiritual leader with your concern. If you have a difficulty, if a church member has a difficulty with a pastor, they are absolutely dead wrong to bypass going to the pastor first with their criticism or difficulty. If they go to someone else, they are sinning against God. Even if he is rightly wrong, you know what I'm saying there? If he, he's, he's wrong. It's still wrong to bypass him. Matthew chapter 18 says, if you have something against your brother and a pastor or a spiritual leader, staff member, other member of the church, spiritual leader, the deacon, their spiritual leader, they still follow under Matthew 18. If you, got a diff if you see them doing something wrong, you go to them first. What are you trying to do? Bring correction. You're trying to deal with it. You're saying, listen, I, I, I just I noticed this and... Correct me if I'm wrong. This is what I saw. It gives them an opportunity. Maybe a misunderstanding. May have seen it wrong, or it may be genuine. And if that person has spiritual humility, Moses like have humility, receive it. And I, I can tell you numerous times in my life where I've had godly people who have come to me personally and said this. And I'm like, you know, you're right. I should have said that. Or, that you, yes, that's right. Yeah, you. Uh, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. You go to him first. Where do most people today go when they got a difficulty? I would say they gossip, but nowadays they go to the social media. They post it. And I mean, they, there's, folks, there are entire websites that are nothing but complaints about churches and ministries and pastors and things. Some of them are right. Some of them are, are you know, have legitimate beliefs, but they've not gone to that person Personally, if you bypass that, that point first, you're sinning against God. You're disobeying His Word. Now, you've gone, and the issue is still there. It's not been that. What's the next thing? You take two or three along with you. You say, you, now, you bring some, now you're bringing witnesses. And you bring them to them and say, listen, you know, I, a couple of folks here are, uh, you know, I, I've, they, they agree with me that this is something that needs to be corrected. And again, the idea is to get correction. The idea is for repentance to come. The idea for there to be a change. You're, you're giving grace. That's what this process is all about. And that's the second thing. Second thing, it says it requires factual evidence corroborated by witnesses. I heard... Somebody told me, I was reading somewhere, a blog post or a Facebook post, and did you hear what I heard? If you're doing that about a spiritual leader within the church, you're sinning against God. It's wrong. Because you've not followed that process, you're spreading, and it, it might be truthful, I understand that. But you have not carried through the process of dealing with it to be able to get it changed and corrected. Two or three witnesses. Bible says, do not admit a charge against an elder except the evidence of two or three witnesses. You see, after meeting with the leader privately, then charges can be taken to the elders of the church. Now, if you're spiritually a deacon, in our situation, a lot of times deacons have to deal with this. There's an issue. Here's what you, let me give you five questions. When someone says, I've been to the pastor. I didn't get any satisfaction there. Uh, I'm bringing it to you. Here's some questions to give that person to find out, okay, is this legitimate? Let's get the facts here. What's your reason for telling me? 
Where did you get your information? Is it firsthand or have you heard this? Have you gone to the pastor directly yourself? Have you personally checked out the facts or are what you're saying to me what you've heard? Can I quote you when I check this out? What are you doing here? You're gathering facts. You are not working on opinion, on rumor, what someone else said. And this person, a lot of times, what will happen is this, is that the person who has a problem, they, they originally have the problem, they, not going to, they won't go to the pastor, but instead of going to the pastor, they spread it on to someone else. And a person hears that and they go, oh, that's terrible. And they go, we got to correct this. And so the person who's not directly involved <coughs> has heard it from somebody else now says, okay, now let's go. I got, I got to go tell somebody. So they go tell a deacon. That's when you ask those questions. Are you personally involved? Have you gone to the pastor with this? Where did you get your information? Is there other people that corroborate this? What's good? You get your facts. And when you've got the facts together and you've eliminated that it's not personal, that it's not a rumor, that two or three people have, have witnessed this, now those spiritual leaders, with a spirit of humility and obviously with brokenness, no one should want to confront a spiritual leader, even if a spiritual leader is in the wrong. No one should want to do that with a spirit of glee, with a spirit of gotcha, with a spirit of now we can get rid of him. We ought to be broken. I mean, we ought to be humble before the Lord, realizing that if this accusation is true, it's going to be damaging to the pastor the staff member, it's going to be damaging to our church, it's going to be damaging to the cause of Christ, and if there is no repentance, it's just going to be a mess. And oh God, we don't want to see a mess in our church and in your kingdom. But to check your motivation out. Number three, it requires public rebuke if there is no repentance. Let's, let's for instance say that it is found out that there is a moral failure by the spiritual leader. And someone has come to them and said, Pastor, I have evidence that there's a moral failure here in your life. Is this true? And then there's not satisfaction there. or If there's an admitting, then hopefully there's a repentance and there's a whole process for that. But... Maybe there's a denial of it, but then there are other witnesses and there people are, it, this, it's been confirmed that this is true and now spiritual leadership is coming to the pastor to confront him with this moral failure and he remains adamant that he is not guilty, that this has not happened and whatever, and he is, the evidence is there. What do you do then? Then, when there's unrepentant, corroborated, evidential sin against God. Because the pastor spiritual leader is a public figure, this cannot be handled privately. It's got to be public. What's the third level in Matthew 18? You bring it to the church. And you say, sad as this is that we have come under evidence of moral failure, we have it's corroborated, there is an unrepentant spirit by the spiritual leader who was guilty of charged and we are by God's command having to deal with this and you've got to remove it. Do you, do you see the process? Is that how churches handled it? No. It's right here. There's a process to correct the wrong that's biblical, that has restoration at every point, that does not keep... The, so people, well, they kept it hush-hush. No, 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 this is not kept hush-hush. This is not swept under the rug. This is not, well, they took care... No, 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 this is... We have dealt with this. And you make it public. So what does it do at that point? This is for unrepentance now. The Bible says that in 1 Timothy that the rest may stand in fear... 
Doing it this way clears the name of the church. It causes others to be fearful of sinning. I'm telling you that if some of the spiritual leaders who have fallen into failure had had this process done to them biblically correct, they would not have continued. What happens is a pastor gets a moral failure. No one deals with it. He resigns suddenly, moves to another part of the country, and then he pastors again. And guess what he will do in the second church? The same thing he just did. Our Southern Baptist Convention had to deal with this several years ago and is still dealing with the effects of covered over abuse and of pastors who were in moral failures because the biblical process that is in place to deal with it, to shine the light of Christ on it so it can be seen, it's a cancer to be cut out, not to be dealt with, mamby-pamby, public, an unrepentant spiritual leader in moral failure should not, should be done public and everybody should know about it so that he is not allowed to go into the ministry and do it again. Why? We're protecting the honor of God. Let me finish with this. Moses, like Jesus, was falsely accused by his brothers. Moses and Jesus didn't defend themselves when they were accused. Moses and Jesus both interceded for those that accused him. Jesus said from the cross, forgive them for they know not what they do. The humiliation of Moses provided the, ultimately the remedy for the forgiveness and mercy that Miriam and Aaron received. The humiliation of Jesus on the cross provides our salvation. But we also need to remember to reject Jesus is ultimately to reject the only way of intercession and forgiveness for our sins. You see, Jesus is the ultimate authority. He's the one that is the way of salvation for us. He's our interceder for us. We don't need to reject his leadership in our life. Let's pray. Father, for your word, we're thankful. And Lord, these are uh, somewhat difficult circumstances, but Lord, very practical circumstances because they, Lord, they deal with, with issues that, of which we are familiar, uh, of Lord, of which we've seen uh, things like with Miriam and Aaron to do it wrongly, and Lord, even in our own, my own life, seen it done wrongly. And there's a right way. And Father, I pray for those in spiritual leadership, Lord, that you would protect them from the assaults of the enemy, that they can lead like Moses with a spirit of humility, and that when criticism comes their way, that they will live a life such that the Lord Jesus would come and defend the honor of that man of God. And Father, that's what we pray for as we pray for our pastor to come and lead this congregation, Lord, that he will be like Moses humble, not desiring power, when criticized has a humble and gracious spirit as which all pastors will get criticized, having love and grace toward those that come against him. And Father, we pray that you would protect him, give him a soft heart, clean heart, and an upright walk with you and that he truly would be Moses, the man of God for this congregation, to lead them in the days of head that they may, we may be led to the promised land. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you for joining us today for Wednesday in the Word.